talking um, specifically about the um, ways that the new um, or the revised prior learning assessment um, policy is um, affecting um, our faculty members or instructional leaders. Um, we did two focus groups this morning, one for people who are more focused on registration, um, admissions and records um, to evaluators, then we did one a little bit later for advisors. Um, people in tech centers, that kind of thing, that, that um, particular type of service, and then um, now we're visiting all of you. Um, so, I do a little bit of a presentation for you, not very long. I'm hoping that most or many of you were able to take advantage of our introductory session on Monday or Tuesday that's been recorded, and you're going to be getting a copy of it so you can um, to it at your leisure. Um, so don't worry too much if you weren't able to do it, but I am shortcutting the information on this so that you're not getting an entire another presentation. I try to focus the information in ways that would be, I hope, pertinent to all of you. So what I looked at for each of the groups is uh, the policy and some of the things that have um, changed about the policy or some of the elements of the policy that I thought would be important for you. So the first things, and actually for this group, I've given you a, a kind of a broader scope because you do have a bigger perspective to some extent. So um, the policy requires that we open our, our arms essentially in terms of prior learning assessment credit so that student information is clear, concise, and published. This was not part of the past policy. It's been added with the intention of the strong intention of making this an outwardly facing transparent process for students to encourage them to take advantage of it. Um, and for those who qualify. Students no longer required to earn one credit in residency prior to transcripting PA credit. The importance of that is that a um, couple of things. We found out through some research and, and talking with um, some people in the country who have done well with this that any kind of a requirement like that was a disincentive for students who might not have come to the college otherwise. So students who prior learning assessment opportunities or who have learning that could earn them credit who, um, might not come to college at all if there was any kind of a, um, a barrier, a perceived barrier to them. And for some students, um, a lot of students in the category who have never come to school <clears throat> but who have significant learning, <clears throat> excuse me, significant outside of school, one of the things that happens is this kind of low self-efficacy around I can be a college student. And so right off the bat, we say to them, well, you don't get to be a college student until you can show us you can be a college student. It becomes a disincentive. So we've shipped that. We took that one credit requirement away. Students do have to be admitted to the institutions. So they have to fill out the forms. And they do have to declare a program of study. The PL credit must apply to the declared program of study. They can't just simply transcript credit. It doesn't work that way. A lot of reasons for that, partly because what we're after is helping them to focus their efforts in the direction that will help them complete a credential. And then also that there are financial aid ramifications, transfer ramifications. If they transcript too much credit, that doesn't count toward a program. Best practices suggest the courses should be from the CCNS as possible, or that they should be crosswalked from the CCNS as possible, avoiding excessive elective credit. It's practice for a long time that when we couldn't find or if a transcript evaluator or whomever was looking at this couldn't find what they thought was an equivalent, they transcripted as elective credit. We're allowed to do that. It's part of the transfer policy. It's part of, um, you know, we're allowed to transcript things like um, um, C credit. Um, we could put it into an elective category because the student does have demonstrated learning, but it isn't to the best advantage of the student. The students are going to do best if we focus credit so that it's meaningful to them in their degree. And then created um, both a PA credit matrix and the dashboard tool. And the PLA credit matrix is a um, set of data that gives the information about um, the assessments and the credit crosswalks, so things like standardized tests and the crosswalks. And we're gathering information about prior assessments that are made by faculty for things like um, certain types of courses, certain types of credentials, um, most of that ACE credentialing that are already in the system that have happened prior to these changes that we can get into that matrix. And moving forward, because the policy requires subject matter experts to do evaluations of these equivalencies, we are trying to fit into the system an opportunity to gather that information so that we can get into a matrix and stop duplicating a lot of effort, which is something that we've all been doing 
one of the biggest things I found when I started looking into this and researching is that there's a huge duplication of effort across the institutions. It also created um, a perception that um, PLA is time consuming, it's expensive, or there's no resources to support it. And part of what I found was is that there's so much going on that you all do the same day and over and over again that there are a lot of opportunities for us to kind of trim that back so that it isn't quite um, the burden that might have been in the past. Um, in procedures, we've done things. We changed the PLA coding. A lot of reasons for that. Partly because right now the way that it's coded, it's very difficult to track what's the PL credit and which credits for which courses um, help students. How we're moving forward with that, um, kind of looking at ourselves all you know all together and being able to track our activities is difficult because the coding is um, has been kind of um, out of opportunity for people to make decisions about what they put into the code, and that has created um, difficulty in, in pulling data together. Um, so we changed the PLA coding to be much more precise, much more prescribed. Um, the use of the dashboard by students to gather credentials and PLA credit information prior to advising is a new part of this. The dashboard is, is um, essentially a GUI that's going to sit over that um, matrix, and it will, um, it's an interactive tool that will be on all of your websites. We're giving it to your communications directors, and they're going to put a button on your front pages that says something lines of, um, you know, do you think that you, what you already know, could earn college credits, something like that. You click a button, and it opens up the dashboard. It's not on your servers. It's, a, it's a, out in the cloud. And um, the student creates an account. All required of them is an email um, and their name. And that account then becomes theirs. It's available to them and it's saved for them. And they're asked a series of questions that have to do with PLA. Did they take standardized tests? Did they have a joint services transcript? All of these different things that would um, lead to these crosswalks. And it is completely referenced in the data for the matrix. So that when a student enters, I took a club English test and I had a score of 50. And they, um, at the end of this process, get their report. What it says is you may be eligible for credit for three credits for English 121. We the end in the report that's produced for the student, you may be eligible for these things. We don't tell them, we don't promise anything. We don't tell them, you know, yes, you're going to get this. But some of those we can say yes, they will, because we understand that they are established crosswalks. And so what we try to do with this tool is to gather the information that advisors need with advisors having to sit for that, you know, half hour or 45 minutes with the student getting all of this information. We also have advice for the student of gathering credentials. If you say that you have an electrician's apprenticeship, you need to show your apprenticeship card. Um, if you have a NIM certificate, you need to show proof of that. Um, if you took a CLEP test, we need to see your transcript. If you have ACE credit, you have to have a transcript. So the types of things that we try to take care of before the student comes to the campus. They're asking of the institutions, and I'm sending out a note let, probably next week to gather this information, is one or two names at the institution or, or, or um, emails, it could be a department email, where this, when the student is finished, they have an opportunity to either print or save or any of those three on that report. So they want to send it. That, that there's a point in the process where they have to choose which college they'd like to connect themselves to doesn't commitment to them to the college, but it just means this is the place I'm going to go to talk to somebody about PLA. They choose college, and what pops for them when they say they want to send it is the email address of the person who's going to receive it. And there's a, a set note in it that says, I'd like to make an appointment to talk with you about my prior learning assessment opportunities. And what to have happen out of that is that there's this, uh, first of all, immediate engagement of, I could, pro I could probably earn some credits. The next of we've even done the email for you, and all you need to do is set up the appointment, and it's it's a it's a way of moving students across that bridge to engagement into the institution. And typically, once they come and see an advisor, those conversations continue well. But we think it's a good way to get them there, and to both to gather their information and create some efficiencies for advising, so that they're overwhelmed with all of this inquiry. Um, all the um, in all of the procedures of the of the um, New policy state that any kind of equ equivalency that's being judged or assessed has to be a subject matter expert. One of the important things to think about with that is that that can drive these decisions about equivalencies. So it's not someone else making that decision for you. 
but also about making sure that we are working together to agree on some things so that you're not having to continuously duplicate. Um, one of the big pieces of that that you should know about that you might not be aware of is that in the policy it says that any credit that is transcripted for prior learning assessment at any community college in the system will count at any other community college. So it's an automatic transfer. There's no reassessment. There's no rejection of that PLA credit based on someone else's criteria. All PLA credit will transfer. Um, and I think it's to everyone's benefit because of that to get on the same page about what those assessments look like and what we all agree on is the love mastery, those other things. Um, so part of that is reporting those crosswalks that you do create or that you do evaluate and then getting them into the matrix so that they can be shared across the system and give everyone from duplicating efforts. Up the credit matrix are going to be ongoing. It's going to be a very dynamic product. We're going to have it housed here at, this, at CCCS, and I'm working here with, the, um, with some of the system people to find out where we want it to live permanently. But in the interim, I'll be going ahead and managing the, the um, CS, um, very simple, and making sure that it's kept updated. And then I've been working with um, Johnson here to make sure that the, banner, the crosswalks are also in banners so that the registrars and transcript evaluators can have those readily at hand and also not have to go searching for the information. The other working on is a common cost matrix that's not finished yet, and we need to get it out for some um, commentary um, probably in the next couple of weeks. Essentially, what we're looking at is um, a common cost to all, for all institutions. So if a student is going to do a portfolio, the to them will be the same at one college as it is at another. We need to decide what that will be, how it will be based. There's a lot of conversation going on around that right now, and you'll get to be part of that. And we're pushing hard against the idea of transfer advisement because we do not have a state policy yet that allows these credits to simply transfer. Students will um, often be stopped at the door in the four-year institutions. What I'm encouraging is for our reach to our partner four-year institutions, whatever they may be, to talk about this new system, to talk about the rigor, to talk about the way we are um, sizing things like um, the evaluated process process and saying you know, we're all looking at doing this in a way that is transparent and that's um, supportable and you know you can look at any one of these things and know that we've um, tested all of the rigor that would be expected and we've tested it against the CCNS and we have good faith that this is a um, this is a strong equivalency it's important for us to do that outwardly facing so that the four institutions have faith that we're continuing in this process and that's going to take some time to build because People need to learn, people need to, to trust, people need to build. So, but I'm, you know, encouragement is that anything that, and it's in the policy and procedures actually, anything that's put into any articulation agreement, um, there should be some kind of a statement in there about prior learning assessment credit. And we want to deal with that in an articulation. They're pretty much the same standardized testing, challenge exams, developed by faculty. One, one of the things that's a little bit new is that we're, collecting information from all the institutions, and we actually did a survey last month that we're completing now. All of the, we asked all of the institutions, what courses do you offer challenge exam opportunities for in by college and by, te by class? And we're creating a list of those in matrix. So if he says, they in challenging in English 121 class, which of the colleges offer the opportunity to challenge? Again, saving education, saving, um, Hopefully, save the extra effort. If the student has to go one town over to do that, um, that means that they can do it there without having the college closest to them having to um, develop a whole new test. The other thing encouraging is for the colleges to talk to each other and to be willing to um, share these things as much as possible. It makes sense. Um, and I know there are often um, bumps on this because people um, have made different curricular choices, but um, I think it would be good for the the students for us to be able to share those as um, as we see fit. Um, those will be locally evaluated. We're also um, encouraging um, third-party um, evaluation if um, we will go with that. If a student wants to pay for the Learning Counts product, that we will accept Learning Counts um, uh, recommendations for um, evaluations. Um, and then we're also um, instigating faculty training around this. We're going to do the resources for this whole movement have come from the CHAMP grant. Um, it's one of the tracks that we're meant to be following. 
And what we're going to do is offer a faculty training in the spring, and um, we haven't quite finished figuring out how we're going to ask you to either recommend or allow um, faculty to come, but we'll be able to train 75 faculty um, all the training in um, evaluation, and it, when they're finished, they will be certified to be able to do portfolio evaluation for accounts and for HALE, which for them an opportunity for a little bit of extra income if they were interested. But probably what we're after is a train-the-trainer model where we learn about the best practices around evaluation of um, credit for prior learning and that we then share that with our peers to be able to spread the, um, you know, the benefit of those resources. And be ongoing. There's also some conversation about having one, um, some of many of those faculty who are involved in that training help us with creating a MOOC that we could make available to any faculty who are interested in, in increasing their skills. Ultimately, what we'd like is that all faculty are aware of the principles and practices of self evaluation. Um, and finally, the published guides. Um, we're working with ACE recommendations. We've been accepting ACE recommendations since the 80s. Um, as a system, it's not new. Um, the crosswalks from ACE recommendations have been traditionally evaluated in a couple of different ways, sometimes by transcript evaluator, sometimes by faculty member. What we are saying in the policy is that faculty members have to be the evaluators, but again, we don't have to continuously reevaluate. So if someone does something, they report out to the matrix, we can there and it won't have to be done again. Um, this is for the military credit recommendations from ACE. And then there's another organization called NCRS that makes recommendations. We don't see them very often, but we will accept those recommendations as well. The P published guides that's relatively new is that we're also adding a section for locally um, evaluated workforce um, training. So since um, we had a, a member of the um, CHAMP, one of our partners, made a request that we put together a team to come in and evaluate um, their training to see if their training and the people that, you know, the way that their people move through it and the levels that they work at and all of that, that it could be eligible for any credit so that we could have um, a, a, an evaluated um, sources to say that if a student has, um, you know, the credential to say that they've had this amount of experience or their sign off on their supervisors that they know how to do certain things, they could then give them credit. We haven't set that up yet, but that was a request from business. So, the third part of this on published guides allows for that to happen. And I think that that's pretty much been happening right along, but it's always been very informal, um, you know, that it's, it's good partnership with industry to say, well, you know, people who have already gone through our training, but we want them to get a little bit more, will you give them some credits there at your college? And, and I think many faculty have said sure because they can see where the, where the skills are and then what the skill enhancements need to be. So we formalize that to the extent where it's entering into the matrix and people will know that. So if somebody does train at WITMIX and gets a certification for a certain number of credits because what they've done, um, they decide to move into the metro area and want to go to another, you know, want to go to a college here, that, that those credits ought to be able to be transcripted and um, to come kind of in another program. The entire purpose of this is to be um, open and transparent for students to be able to start where they begin instead of having to repeat themselves because they can't credential the learning that they've had outside the um, educational environment. It's really important. The assessor is just talking back at that a little bit, but the, kind of the keynote, we've done a course equivalency model, model and that's to the CCNS um, and to CCNS competencies. Uh, to determine what method is most effective to demonstrate and document learning outcomes, so they would be helping advisors or they would be helping the student decide, well, you know, I think portfolio is going to be the best way to go because you don't have any, um, you haven't earned any certificates or credentials through your work or through your training, but, um, you know, it looks to me like you have a lot of skills that you demonstrate in other ways. Um, or it may be that you say, well, you have a combination of a couple of certificates, but if you can demonstrate this particular part of this that's not within your credentialed learning, we can give you credit for something. It needs to be an open process where we look at the whole student, look at the whole curriculum and say, what does it take for you to demonstrate this to me? And so and it's not about not requiring demonstrated skill. It's about being open to how that skill can be demonstrated. Um, the C calls for C-level or above mastery. Um, there was some conversation um, when we met to do the ACE, ACP about some um, programs feeling as though a B mastery was um, more appropriate. 
um, in policy that a sea level of mastery is appropriate and in transfer sea level of mastery is appropriate. In a major, if you feel that you need to see a higher level of skill from a student, it's certainly reasonable to say that you'd like to see other demonstrations if you're going to give them something other than core, um, but it will be a sea level of mastery or above. Um, options, you can extend for full credit. You can look at something and say, yep, you've met all of our criteria. We, you, you have learning that we're looking for. Say you don't have an equivalency and, and we're not, um, I can't, you know, give credit for this. Or you say that um, it looks like you have some of it, we need more information, or what you've given me didn't quite give me enough information. So there's all kinds of ways that we can be flexible in that process. But the faculty assessors will be trained that process. And we're using, <coughs> excuse me, um, standards for assessing learning from the Assessing Learning Standards, Principles, and Procedures book, which was published out of, um, or they, they sell it out of KL, but actually pretty excellent. And I'm giving you a quick snapshot here, and you'll get this um, using PowerPoints or whatever. And it's also, if you look up, um, if you just um, Google standards, you'll see it. But essentially, it, it, these are the principles that we built the policy on. These are the principles that we want to build our assessment on. Edited, or its equivalent should be awarded only for learning, not experience. It should be based on standards and criteria for the level of acceptable learning that are both agreed upon and made public. So there's no secrets about what does it take to get the credit. It should be treated as an integral part of learning, not separate from it, and be based on understanding of learning processes. Term credit awards and competence levels must be made by appropriate subject matter and academic or credentialing experts, which is the decision we made to put it in policy. Credit or credentialing should be appropriate to the context in which it is awarded and accepted. In other words, it should be appropriate to the degree pathway. If awarded for credit, transcript entry should clearly describe what learning is being recognized and should be monitored to avoid giving credit twice for the same learning, and we've created that in our systems, and actually was already created in the system, but we've, we've enhanced that data collection. Policy procedures and criteria applied to assessment, including vision for appeals, should be fully disclosed and prominently available. That's included in our manual, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Fee for assessment should be based on the services performed in the process and not determined by the amount of credit awarded. This is one of those ones that we've gone back and forth on. One argument against, um, you know, policy says is that we cannot, you know, we don't charge for the credit or we can't charge tuition, but we charge for the assessment. Most that we can charge for any assessment is no more than 50% of the um, credits awarded, 50% of the cost of the credits awarded. What we add is how can we build a structure that allows institutions to have um, a, a revenue base to a certain extent that will support these activities. The only of these activities that require significant labor, essentially, is the uh, portfolio assessment process. That can be streamlined to a certain extent if we create uh, things like portfolio templates. So if the department is willing to use a portfolio process, they create a template in the same way that they might create a challenge exam in that in order for a student to challenge out of this class, this particular class in our discipline, to meet all of these competencies at a, a see or better mastery, they need to demonstrate these particular skills so that we can test against those competencies. And you have that ready to go if the students that would like to do a portfolio. The thing that we're encouraging is the development of an online course, perhaps in one credit course, and we could see about developing it through CCCI, perhaps that would give the student how to build a portfolio, which would then, again, take that labor intensiveness off of a faculty member. The model that I've seen that I think is excellent is a class like that for students with the um, inclusion of whomever is teaching the class as the monitor, not the monitor, but as the mentor for the, the um, assessment process. So helping a person build the portfolio, but then they're not the person who evaluates it. It would be evaluated by a subject matter expert. So the cost evaluation would cost to that student to have evaluated by the subject matter expert, not to develop the portfolio, which is currently the way that we do those things. And the costs typically across institutions don't really match, the, or the, the fees that we charge don't match the costs that we uh, spend. So we're looking at this as a, a more balanced um, financial model that might work better for institutions. There is always going to be an institutional input to this process because we're not going to charge people, you know, the exact cost of everything that we have to do. It's not reasonable. 
what is true about this and what the data will show you if you wanted to go out and look at it is that these students often are students who would not come to us otherwise. These students are also students who persist at a significantly higher rate than other students. These students are students who also at a significantly higher rate complete. So on the other side of getting them into the school with some PLA credit is that they earn more credit and they complete at a higher rate than their peers without PLA. So it's a real indicator that it's a good activity for us. Um, we do adequate training for personnel involved in assessment learning and we're really working on trying to make that happen with the, um, I apologize, we're working on making that happen with some of the CHAMP funds at this point and then seeing, you know, working with all of you about how can we continue to make that happen. And then this program should be regularly monitored, reviewed, evaluated, and revised as needed to reflect changes in the needs being served, the purposes being met in the state of the assessment arts. And that's one of those ones that, that we need to um, consider in terms of leadership over time and saying how do we um, create some sustainability around that once my position is gone from CCCS, uh, positions in the state, can we have um, people who are responsible at each institution who gather in the same way that the registrars and the advisors do, or could it be part of a registrars and advisors group in conversations, I think, in terms of sustainability. So that we have at the moment and things that we're pushing, we're moving against this or toward this um, effort, we have the faculty evaluator training that will be happening in the spring. We have funds for about 75 people. Um, those people will then be CALE certified evaluators. We're looking at the trainer model. We're also looking at developing some MOOCs um, webinars for ongoing training, which would be relatively easy to do and to have that information continuing to stay out there for faculty. Um, creating for, at the system level a PLI credit web page. All of you have, um, through the ACE ACP process, created an ACE ACP page. And we'll be asking you to take a look at your own prior learning assessment information and making it more um, open and available to your, your students. So you attach yourselves to the SIN page to get all that information. But everything that we talk about in terms of what's going on with the policy, procedures, manual, all of these things will be posted on that PLA credit web page. It's under construction at the moment. And when we have the documents ready, we'll be opening it up probably the beginning of January. Um, the same procedures would be there, the PLA credit manual and um, KL and ACE resources. The PLA credit manual is in draft form. It's going to be coming out to all of you, anyone who signed up for these webinars, and we ended up with almost 200 people from all the institutions, is an email with an attachment that has the manual in draft form. I'm asking all of you to take a look at it during a comment period that will last from November 16th through 30th. And I want you to get back to me specifically with um, commentary of what's there, what's missing, what you would like to see, what you don't like that you are seeing. Um, you don't need to wordsmith it. You don't need to edit it. Um, asking for commentary. And we're going to take that commentary and, and um, put it together in the draft and then take it back to the Higher Learning Assessment Committee in December for final um, approval. And it will go to um, our legal here at CCCS for approval. It will go up to the provost and then up to the president. We're almost there. And um, part of what I've encouraged your institutions to do in um, talking with your communications folks and the rest is, is that I'm saying hold off on your big pushes around um, any kind of um, um, marketing until your people on the ground are ready to go and then until you have these things in hand um, or until you feel confident that you understand what you need to do. So um, there's not going to be a lot of um, difficulty because we don't have the information. I'm hoping that you'll feel that you have all the information you need to do this well when we start. Um, and access to the PLA credit dashboard, um, part of what that it created for a student user, we're creating it so that there's another way for you to go into it as administrators. Um, anyone who wants to can go into it and take a look at those crosswalks. So if you're an editor working with a student and you need to, you know, I don't remember what a CLEP 50 in English gets them, you can put that in and get the information. And you can see, um, you know, who's the advisor over it you know, the other college that I'm sending this kid to, and I can give them a name or I can send them an email. All of these things that will make the, um, the process more transparent for all of you and easier to, to facilitate. Um, and then communications have 
I'll have the link for the dashboard to be able to put it on your web pages. They've also been given a pretty extensive marketing toolkit that they're going to be using to help you push this out. They have, um, oh, have press releases, they have um, text and pictures and all kinds of other things for social media. They have lots of suggestions about how to recruit students. Um, it's something that, that uh, Kale created for them and it's very good. They're waiting for your go ahead to go ahead and launch that. And I asked them to talk with vice presidents, um, deans, um, advisors to find out what's a good time to push that out. Student access to the PLA support email for advisement link, that's the piece that we are going to need from all of you. Who, well, they have access to that, but who do we um, want to direct those inquiries to? At the end of the point where they're finished with the dashboard, they have the ability to click send and that on to whomever it is that you've designated at your institution to ask for an appointment. So we'll be asking you, not today, but we'll be asking you to help us um, to flesh out a list for institution um, of emails where students can send those reports to and to make appointments to come in and see someone. So the entire presentation went a little bit longer than I, I um, had intended, but I'm going to do to be able to talk to each other. It's on your screen now. The first step is that if you have a question or a comment or a concern or something you want us all to talk about, you're going to put it into the chat box and send it to all participants. Anyone can just go ahead and do that now. You don't have to wait question to question. Just go ahead and type them and send them. And what I'm going to do is go down them one at a time from the first and moving down the line. And when I get to yours, I will unmute your voice and ask you to ask the question. And we'll talk about it. And um, it may be necessary or I may feel like I need to ask um, some input from someone of you or I may ask someone else's opinion. Or if you have um, an opinion on something and you want to talk, you can put it into the chat and say, I have something to say about that, and I'll open it up and let you talk. So I, I'll control to some extent how many people are talking at one time, which will be like me and one other person. But um, I want to make sure that everybody has a voice. If you have questions or you want to start this conversation, go ahead and put them into the chat box. And you hit send and send to all participants, and everyone will see them, and we'll to get started on this conversation. I'm sure that they're out there. I know one of the biggest faculty concerns was about the ACE ACP project and what happened with all of that. Um, oh, good. Okay, so George has one. And I'll go ahead. George, hold on just a second. I'm going to um, unmute and let you ask the question for the group. So you can go ahead. Okay, so for our machining program, the National Institute for Metalworking Skills credential projects require faculty exceed the C level CCS competencies for the equivalent courses. Does that cannot use the NIMS projects for PLA? Require them to exceed the C level? No. The, the, taking the NIMS credentials are optional for our students. Okay. But the projects that are that are used in the NIMS credentialing process exceed a level for the equivalent courses that we're giving them. Okay. Now the projects are harder than the first projects that uh, are in, included in our courses. Okay. I would say that um, it would be reasonable to um, to award them the courses at the C level and that they wanted to request the credential from you to that same venue that you would you could require whatever you need to in terms of the um, in terms of the projects. That yeah, I think you're in understanding. So if we use the NIMS projects as the uh, challenge test, if you will, right? And they don't, and they're not able to complete the NIMS test, that means that they wouldn't be able to pass our course with a C. Right. Right. Is that, would, you, would you give them credit for the course and then they wouldn't get the credential? Uh, if they took them's credential, they'd get the credential and they'd get the credits for the course. Right. We weren't able to complete the project 
problem. I don't know how we'd be able to evaluate whether. I mean, I guess it'd be a, a, a assessment by the subject matter expert as to whether or not uh, the performance on the NIMS project would equal, be equivalent to a C. The other option would be to give them our course projects and see how they do. I guess. Yeah, I was exactly. two birds with one stone. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's exactly right. That that what it's about is how do you um, get them to satisfactorily meet your competencies. So it's reasonable to say that that would be required. The other thing you could think about is that if somebody comes in with the NIMS certificate already, does that mean that they have the equivalence of your courses? Probably it would. Okay. So that's the kind of thing you, you'd probably be more likely to see that, but at anything like that where what, what results is a credential that requires a certain level of demonstration, that would make good sense that you would require that demonstration of knowledge. That's, that would be yeah. more of a, of a portfolio, so definitely right. appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So now we have is from Stanton, and I'm going to open you up here in a second, Stanton, and I'll let you ask. So go ahead. One of your previous slides that you had, that box number one said something about awarding credit for learning, not experience. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of like portfolio experience. Okay. Would if they put a portfolio together, we would award that, or you know, view it, and then maybe credit the class. So I wonder what you were re I, I, uh, award credit for experience. So, so it would be the difference between saying, for somebody coming in and saying, um, you know, I get an IT certificate, I worked for HP for 10 years. Well, you worked for HP for 10 years, we'll give you an IT certificate. But then when you find out what they worked at, they were an admin assistant and they hadn't, didn't have anything to do with computers. So you want to, you know, way to do it so that you're not gauging experience but gauging actual learning is that you need to see some kind of a demonstration. So that demonstration could be, um, it could be some kinds of certifications in the field. It'd be um, different, you know, like if it were a computer certification of some sort, there's all kinds of things that um, IT professionals earn as they move forward. It could be, you know, a, an established badge or something, for instance. Um, but the like, difference between it is that just to say, I worked at a job for a certain amount of time doesn't necessarily mean that they have the skills and knowledge that you need for them to meet those um, competencies. So look at what they know and what they've learned, not what they've done. Um, sometimes, you know, just to muddy the waters, sometimes what they've done inform what they know. You know, if they've been a master electrician for 10 years, that says something, but not always. And so we, we look first to how is the learning demonstrated? If it's not actually a, it's not an actual demonstration that I'm looking at, is it a demonstration via credential of some sort that gives me that? Or is it a combination of credentialing and demonstration that helps me to understand that they, not only did they have the experience, but they learned and they know and they have the skill and knowledge that will show me that they have that, um, they have the understanding. So that's the real difference. Okay, thank you. Uh, good, thank you. Um, and you know you're, that we're recording this. Um, I will be sending you links to the recordings on Monday along with the manual and all the rest of it. You're going to get an email by the end of the day on Monday. It'll come out via um, Mary Cornell from me, and it's going to have um, the recordings from all of the sessions. So if you wanted to listen to the groups or with the introduction, if you didn't get a chance to sit in on that, it'll draft manual, the policy. Um, I put in it listed, it would have the system procedures, but those are still um, going through legal here. So I won't put those out just yet, but when they're out, I'll put them out. Um, and then if I'm able to, I'm going to compile an FAQ from these, but I might not get to it before Monday. So um, if there are things that you can think of that you would like to have, I'm happy to attach to that, but that, that's, that's when you'll get those. Um, and send the PowerPoint, yes, I will attach the PowerPoints as well. I just made myself a note for that. Okay, Susanna, um, looks like you're up next. Let me unmute you. Okay, go and ask the question. Well, um, summer teacher ed programs that we trans 
for students to I think of Adam State and a few others. I expect that students will have a bigger, better in the freshman comp classes to accept it into the program. So would it be better then for us to advise students since we're only guaranteeing a C level or better um, if it's awarded credit through LA? Would it be better than just to advise students to do those uh, courses in the classroom? Um, well, it kind of depends. You know, one of the things that you could look at is um, to the receiving institutions, uh, but they would want for reassurances for majors in terms of freshman comp. I mean, you could create a particular portfolio process for those students that they carry with them to the receiving institution to show that they demonstrated those B-level skills. Um, again, you, know, you can be kind of creative about it. You can accept any of it at a C-level if you want to, and then giving them all the information and saying, you know, that there are options for you. I think that the first thing I would do is talk to the receiving institution to see if you can keep them from having to repeat that course. Um, if the receiving institution is confident in the, the you have a portfolio that's that's um, judged at the B level for at majors, then I would go with that and, and create it as an articulation and, you know, write up a, a memorandum of understanding or something along those lines. But um, it's reasonable to, for certain types of things, like th these are good examples. What George talked about, about this credentialing, the credentialing projects and what you're talking about here, that there are circumstances where we're going to have to, you know, up the ante a little bit for some of these equivalencies. But I think that, um, as much as possible, we want to avoid the kind of opting always to, well, you better take the class then, as much as possible. Right, right, right. And I would hate to make a student redo the credit but or the competencies, but um, at the same time, we don't have to do them a disservice Absolutely. by awarding them the credit, and then they get to the four-year institution, and the four-year institution institution says, well, you're not ready for this program yet. Exactly. And it's a very good point. I think that the thing that's important about that, too, and it's not just for something like this, is that we do not have statewide agreements at this point, or we don't have a statewide policy at this point that will allow our PLA credit to simply accept it and transfer without the option of four-year institutions doing more evaluation, which is unfortunate right. at this point, but that's the way it is. But I think the thing about this that we want to think about is that until, and hopefully at some point in the near future, we'll get that. Um, what, what we're trying to do is build confidence. I'm going to mute you back on there again, Suzanne. We're, we're trying to build confidence in our processes to really tightening up this whole thing, tightening up the way that we're assessing courses, having a system that's trans, transparent that anybody could look at and say, oh, that's how you do that. And everybody would say, yep, that's how we do that. Um, to be able to build confidence in four-year institutions that will create those articulations or will create those agreements so that students aren't continuously reassessed. But the most important thing that we can do for students is exactly what Susanna just described. We need to let them know what, what their options are and how that will affect them. In terms of standardized testing, um, uh, standardized testing, the Department of Education is in the process right now of creating a statewide matrix for standardized testing testing that will be the type of thing where we can go ahead and award credit based on that matrix, that that credit will be accepted at the four-year institutions um, based on understanding that the cut score equals this course. And they're really in the weeds on this whole thing now, so I can't say how well they're doing or whether it's going to be a better or a worse process when they're done with it. Um, they're really kind of digging in deeply, but the end is for us to stop requiring students to continuously reevaluate for the same courses. So there's, there's some sense that we're working well for students in that. We'll have to kind of see what comes out of the state on that one. But it is always going to be important until we have a really open um, trust around this stuff to let students know that it's possible the credits that they're awarded might not easily transfer to another institution. It doesn't mean that they won't transfer, but it be that they're going to have to um, Again, that they have that information, that knowledge. Another reason why our practices really need to be a, repro a reproach, and I'm invested in that, in saying that you know, I own faculty don't trust our processes, and you can tell me if you think that's true. I've got a lot of faculty in the line that trust necessarily that we're 
um, that what the students are, uh, we don't trust that the students have the right level of knowledge. We don't trust the evaluation if we even know what the evaluation is. And so automatically assume, and it's a widely held perception, that these offerings are less than, um, the learned less than in some way. And when we believe that ourselves, it's pretty darn hard to um, communicate to any institution that we're sending a student to that we think that they have the requisite skills. But the thing is that if we create the right kind of assessment process and if we hold ourselves to our own standards, we can trust that process. And the, the other fact is that by 47,000 students that, that they data from, from the Kale report called Fueling Race, um, 47,000 students, two-thirds more students with prior learning assessment credit complete degrees, two-thirds, you know, than students who don't have prior learning assessment credit uh, across all demographics. There's some of the data that says this is such a good thing for all of our students that it's hard to let go of the idea that if we just can start to have some faith in ourselves in terms of what we're assessing and then also faith in these students in terms of their ability to succeed, that is going to be a pretty um, pretty awesome opportunity for them and for us. Um, you know, my speech is that there is no less um, time consumed, less less time um, intensive, and less labor intensive, less cost intensive method for us to both recruit, retain, and graduate students. They're just it's, this is this is as easy as it gets in some ways, um, and we don't undermine ourselves academically at all, in my opinion. And I know that that's the primary fear, and it's a good fear. We need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our rigor. Um, but I, I don't feel that this undermines it. And any other questions? I'm giving my elevator speech to you guys. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Concerns? I'm hoping you'll feel comfortable giving me feedback on the manual in terms of what you think about when talking about building this system and building this rigor. To see if, I'm, I'm, if the group is hitting the notes that you expect to see in terms of building that kind of a system, and what do we need to do to to make it happen? Minutes. Any other questions? There are a lot of questions about the ACE ACP process, and I um, spoke with the state faculty um, advisory committee the other day, and we didn't get to talk very much about questions. I talked too long, but um, there was some concerns about how that process happened, how we crosswalked credit for those um, ACE evaluated courses from non-accredited providers, such as Straighter Line. Um, Sophia, edX, and, um, you know, um, I answered the questions in terms of how that, you know, how that process happened. I know that it, it, um, it could have been done in a more um, timely manner in terms of having more people involved, but it, it kind of came on us quickly over here, and I had to get faculty together, and I had to get them together at a time when I could get them together, and also so that I could pay them before the grant ran out, which was what we were trying to do. So we did push it fast in August to get it done. And we did only get 40 out of the 115 courses approved for crosswalks by those um, instructors. Um, another piece of, of that information to keep in mind is that um, um, ACE credit, no matter what, and credit recommendations. And what the credit recommendations do is that they say, like, like we have a workplace training, and we think that this training, a person who um, has successfully completed this training has the equivalent of, you know, uh, communications, three credits, or business credits, or what I might say that way. And that's the extent of the information in terms of the recommendation. And then they tell us all about the curriculum, and they tell us about the assessments. What, what faculty do with that, and what we are, this is part of what's in the policy, is that we ask faculty to look at it and to look at the curriculum and look at the crosswalks, to lay against the CCNS curriculum and say, yeah, I agree, that's an equivalency, and as long as this person passed with a C or been that curriculum, we'll give them those credits. Um, and we put in the matrix so that other people can use it. That's clearly the same process that was done with the um, non-traditional providers' courses. The concerns on a couple of them, one, one giant set of them, all of the social and behavioral sciences courses were rejected for crosswalk because they felt that they didn't have enough of the writing, um, graded writing requirements, so we didn't accept any of them. Um, many of the science, most of the science courses weren't accepted. In chemistry, it was because the labs were really focused on qualitative um, learning instead of quantitative, and our labs are very 
strongly focused in quantitative learning and there wasn't nearly enough so that they didn't accept them. So lots of exactly right reasons that we looked at as far as why we would not call it an equivalency. But my thing about that is something, for instance, um, in, the, in the social and behavioral sciences courses, for instance, every one of those assessments that was completed, some of them just didn't even bother looking at them anymore when they figured out there wasn't writing, but the ones that were completed, they had them and they all said the same thing. The content is definitely enough. Some of them content was more than what they have in their own curriculum, but that they're concerned about the writing. And my feeling was if you have all of the content for that course, to have that student do a portfolio that includes credential that says that they successfully completed that course and writing assignments, maybe two or three papers that they would have to write that would show that they could write an argumentative essay or that they could do a research paper. And wouldn't that be the same demonstration of learning? So again, I, I, I am pushing back at all of this and saying it's not about, it shouldn't be about an all or nothing proposition. It should be about if you really legitimately have this learning, I'm going to help you show me, you know, I'm going to guide you in the process of figuring how can you demonstrate that learning to me? How can you show me that you've learned in this way? And to allow the students to be able to come in and to move forward. And hopefully this, um, this idea of being strongly grounded in our own curriculum, strongly grounded in our own faculty assessment, with an understanding that everybody learns something everywhere and that we ought to be able to compile that into, um, if learning is college level, that it ought to mean something to those students. Elevator speech. Okay, no questions. I see a lot out there. I know you're there. No questions. Concern. Thoughts. You can certainly send me email offline if you prefer not to do it in this um, view, or call me. I'm hack. Um, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to to make some positive um, changes for our students with this process. Okay, so I'm going to say that I'm not seeing any more. No one else is coming, and I'm going to say that this um, wrap up then. Um, please look for in your email at the end of the day on Monday, look for the manual, take some time to look at it and send me your commentary. Um, said you don't have to edit it or um, uh, submit it, but I'd like to hear comments. Um, what you think needs to be added, taken out, fixed, anything like that. And then any other feedback or questions or concerns. And I've also um, offered to your groups and will also offer to you that I would be happy to come to campus at any time to have conversations with people about this uh, faculty with other leadership if you have questions or concerns or need some help in figuring out what's the best way to set up the system on campus I'm happy to help in any way that I can so please let me know after Christmas right January nobody can do anything after Thanksgiving I know that all right well I will um, say that we're finished then and I thank you all very much for attending and for being and participating and um, I will really look forward to hearing from you all and um, hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much.